Let me actually move back a little bit so people can see me. All right, we're live, everyone. We're recording. Welcome, everyone. I'm Brother Doug. Um, I'm with my sister River, our sister Sally, our sister Josie, our sister Sadie, our sister Marissa, and my brother Dennis. We are the Waking by Yahuwah Fellowship Group in Yahuwah Almighty and Yahushua Messiah. Tonight, we're going to be doing a study about when is the new heaven and new earth going to happen? Is it going to happen right before the millennium or is it going to happen after the millennium? Okay. And actually to be more specific after uh, Satan is destroyed and thrown into the lake of fire and no more sin. So first verse we're going to look at here is revelations chapter 21 verse one. Okay, so that's the first one we're going to look at. I mean, so I'm, let's see here. And I saw, so Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So in context, you could say that this is proving that the first heaven and first earth are still during the millennium, if that makes any sense. So you still have the first heaven and first earth since Yahuwah created the earth, that same earth during the millennium, and it doesn't get to the new heaven and new earth until Satan is defeated. The reason we know that is we can go to the prior chapter, okay, and let's see here. Where does it say Satan defeated? Okay, here. Here we go. The defeat of Satan. Revelations 20, verse 7 says, And when the thousand years are expired, so this is talking about the millennium here, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog, Magog, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And you can actually find this foreshadowed in the book of Psalms chapter two. So David actually foretells this or is given the prophecy by Yahuwah to foreshadow this. Okay. It says, wherefore did the heathen rage and the nations imagine vain things the kings of the earth stood up together, and the rulers gathered themselves together against Yahuwah and against his Messiah. Way before Yahushua came to earth, this is prophesied. Okay, so in Revelations 20, verse 8, that's the actual fulfillment of Psalms chapter 2, verse 2. So, and yep, go ahead, Sister Marissa, I see your hands up. Okay, I have a question. So, let me get this straight. After the millennium, the millennium thousand years, or before the millennium thousand years, people are still going to be on the earth. Satan is going to continue to uh, deceive and tempt and all this stuff. And then is when the new Jerusalem is going to come after that? Oh, he's going to be locked in for the thousand year reign. He's going to be locked in like the bottomless pit for the thousand year reign. Then Yahuwah allows him to be loosened out to deceive the nations once more for a great battle before the new heaven, new earth. There's going to be this battle of the end. There's actually two battles of the end. This is where Christianity gets it confused. They think it's one great battle called Armageddon, but there's actually two great battles of the end. There's one before the millennium, which the beast, the antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire and they're defeated already. But then after the millennium, there's a last great battle where Satan has one last chance to get all his armies together to fight Yahu and Yahusha. Then in that battle, Satan is defeated, thrown into the lake of fire. And then you have the white throne judgment where the rest of the dead in the second resurrection are brought back to life. They're judged according to the books. And those that have not accepted Yahusha during their lifetime are thrown into the lake of fire with Satan. So everyone's going to be thrown into the lake of fire after that last great battle in Revelations 20. So Revelations 20 kind of gives you like 
the last big events before the new heaven, new earth. So you have the last great battle, the white throne judgment. And then after all that's done and you only have people that are going to be in the kingdom alive, then you have the new heaven, new earth, if that makes any sense. So that, that's what's going on. It's basically you have a thousand years, Satan's locked up. He's let loose after a thousand years. And then there's a last great battle where he's defeated, thrown into the lake of fire. And right after that, you have the white throne judgment where all the wicked will be thrown into the lake of fire. And then once that's done, you have who is going to create the new heavens, new earth. So prior to that, where will the wicked be? They'll, they'll, they'll still be in Shoal? Yeah, yeah, there's two resurrections. The first resurrection is right after the tribulation. Like Matthew 24, 29 says, um, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will turn into blood, and the sign of the Son of Man will come. So Ye Yahushua's second coming is also known. This is why it's key to understand this, that the second coming of Yahushua is the day of Yahuwah. This is what it's key to understand because it's the same event. The day of Yahuwah's wrath, it's, it's the same exact event. There, Yahushua's second coming is, is the day of Yahuwah's wrath where Yahuwah destroys the wicked. So he destroys like the major. I should say majority of the wicked. Like we said off the record, um, you know, I was reminded that there are going to be some wicked left after the day of Yahuwah that are left over that Yahuwah gives mercy to, to give them a choice, like an ultimatum to serve him at the Feast of Tabernacles, which you can find in Zechariah chapter 14. Like that whole chapter gives you the context of what happens after the first great battle and, you know, how you got, you got people left over who came against Jerusalem that, that Yahuwah says, either you worship me at the Feast of Tabernacles year by year and worship me at the feast and do, you know, convert or you're going to be added to the rest according to the Septuagint. Now the Masoretic text will actually say there will be no rain which I think, you know, they're really watering it down, in my opinion. They say there, there will be no rain. So, you know, it, it's really that Yahuwah is giving an ultimatum for some of the heathen that are left over. There's going to be like a remnant of the wicked that are left over when, he, when the day of his wrath happens. And so when the millennium starts, they're given a second chance even. He actually gives some of the wicked that were not destroyed on the day of his wrath a second chance. So will that be considered as coming no no it's it's only one second coming because when he when he returns and we're caught up with him the post tribulation catching up or or rapture or whatever it's one event spontaneously in a way because you're actually getting caught up and i believe that who who are part of the first resurrection will become part of his angelic army because we're given resurrected bodies so it's actually one second coming and I know it gets kind of confusing, but you're actually getting yes. all at once. Re then he's coming. Remember the first fruits. Yes. So, so it's, not, it's not a third coming. I know some Christians will say it's a third coming, but no, it's, right. it's, it's a second coming. It's a unified one second coming because basically he's taking up the dead in Messiah along with those that are left over from the tribulation. And then once they're caught up, they have resurrected bodies up in the air. They're not going up into heaven. They're just up in the air. They're up in the sky. They're coming down to take vengeance. Who is after the wedding? Yeah. When I said the third coming, I was talking about when he judges the wicked. Oh, no. The judging of the wicked, it's not a third coming because he's already here. He's already here. So the, second, the reason it's called the second coming is because he, he was in heaven and he's coming back to earth. He's going to already be on earth. So that's why it's not considered a third coming. Um, it's already here. So he, he was already here for the millennial physically on earth and he, he's going to have judgment. Um, you know, the white throne judgment is actually going to be right after, I think the defeat of Satan it says in revelations 20. So that's when right. the white throne judgment happens. So anyway, uh, so I think, I think now that that's explained, we'll have a better concept of what's going on here. So um, anyway, so now we're going to go to the controversial verse in this study in this topic that some people take to mean that 
the earth's going to be destroyed on the day of Yahuwah. Some people could interpret it that way. We're going we're gonna to discuss that. Um, second Kapha, Second Peter 3, 10 to 15. Okay, so this is one that if you take out of context, you can get a uh, new heaven, new earth type of idea after the tribulation because of, or after, no, I should say after the day of Yahuwah, some people would think because it, uh, the way it's translated, I'll show you guys what, I, what I'm talking about. So you go to second Peter chapter three, verses 10 to 15 um, says here, but the day of Yahuwah shall come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a rushing noise and the elements burning with heat shall be dissolved. Both the earth and the works that are in it shall be burned up. See, this is where the English translation here will ha have you think that the, the earth is being destroyed on the day of his wrath. Yeah. Um, so, um, but anyway, so let me go. To, and actually what I want to see is with, let me see here. With. Yeah, that's more, more of a purification than anything. Yeah, let me see here. Um, being destroyed by fire shall be loosed in the earth, and in it shall be incinerated. Yeah, see, but what we also got to do is use some common sense here. Then, then we have a contradiction then with Revelations 21.1, if that's the case, because Revelations 21.1, which we just read, is after the defeat of Satan. So then we have a problem. Then, so I would, I would suggest that we... Even though in English it says the earth with those that inhabit it, it's only the inhabitants of the earth in context that would be destroyed. Because again, in our English Bibles in Genesis 6, 7, the same thing gets, same type of event gets translated that way in English. Okay. And it says, um, let me see here. Um, I will blot out man whom I have made now, at least in Genesis, they translate it where you get the idea it's only the inhabitants of the earth, not the earth itself. I have made from the face of the earth. So, and it says from the face of the earth. So at least they translate that to help people understand that it's not the earth itself getting destroyed. Even the man with cattle and reptiles with flying creatures of the sky, for I am grieved that I have made them. So that's Genesis 6, verse 7 in your Masoretic text. It's verse 8 in the Septuagint. So again, we got to use that context because what does Yahushua say? As the days of Noah were, so shall it be in the coming of the sign, uh, sign of the Son of Man. So if it's just like the days of Noah, that means Yahuwah is not destroying the current earth when he first returns. He's destroying the inhabitants of it, the wicked inhabitants of it from the earth. So in my opinion, they should have translated from the earth, just like in Genesis 6, 7, in my opinion. Um, I think it confuses people with um, verse 10 of second Peter chapter three, the way they translate it. And um, the problem is that's only one witness. If you take that translation by itself of that verse, you would, you would still need uh, one or two other witnesses in my opinion to establish truth on that interpretation of that verse. Because no, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't consider the flood to have destroyed the earth. No, it didn't. It didn't destroy the earth. It 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 covered the earth. It didn't destroy it. It destroyed the inhabitants of it, like it says in Genesis six seven. I will destroy man from the face of the earth. So it didn't destroy the earth. It covered it, but it didn't destroy it. It there were certain things that got sunk, but it didn't like. Destroy to me is literally wipe it out. That's destroying the earth. Yeah. Wipe the yeah. earth. Because that's on a second earth, if we accept that. And Revelations 21 says for the first heaven and first earth, that means the earth we're living on is the same exact earth that was from the flood. So it can't be, it, there's no way that that flood literally destroyed it and left it, you know, basically completely gone. It, it sunk certain things, but it didn't destroy it. So, so he's only going to destroy the wicked like he did with the fallen yeah. children. Yeah, like Sodom and Gomorrah too. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, even though there, Sodom and Gomorrah, yeah, there were ashes there, but Sodom and Gomorrah technically, it, it wasn't like he destroyed the earth with Sodom and Gomorrah. 
So it's kind of like the same thing. And Sodom and Gomorrah is a perfect example because he rained fire down from heaven. And that's what Peter is actually saying here. It says, uh, um, the elements burning with heat shall be dissolved, both uh, the earth and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Therefore, all these things that be dissolved, what sort ought you to be in set apart contact and right, uh, not contact, conduct and righteousness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of Yahuwah, because which the heavens being set of fire shall be dissolved and the elements burning with heat shall melt. But according to his promise, we look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness, righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot or blemish. And consider that the long suffering of our master is salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, as in all his letters, speaking in some about things which are some things that are hard to understand, which the unlearned and the unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on guard lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being carried away by the error of the wicked. So, again, I would suggest we take it in context. If, like I said, if Yahushua literally meant that it's going to be as the days of Noah, the flood did not destroy the earth, and it, it destroyed the inhabitants of the earth. It sunk the earth, which would destroy the inhabitants because they die from, you know, the flood. So that's what really happened. And yes, I understand certain cities sunk and stuff like that, but that's not literally destroying the earth. Destroying is like, literally rendering it to nothing and like basically making basically would be completely getting rid of it would destroy it like that so but anyway um so now we're up to 20 chap, chapter 21 verse 10 of revelations 21 which says no temple which seems to indicate no sacrificial system so i'm going to explain what i mean here by going to the actual scripture here um, so Revelations 21, verse 10, which says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city. So the great city is talking about the new Jerusalem, the set apart Jerusalem descending out of heaven from Yahuwah. So where did I, I guess I got the, uh, wrong verse there. Uh, that's that's kind of weird. All right. Um, let's see. Let me just look for that real quick. There is no temple. Oh, my bad, guys. It's verse 22. I'm sorry. That's my bad about that. All right. So verse 22 of that same chapter. All right, so here we go. Verse 22 here, it says, And I saw no temple therein, for Yahuwah Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And so here we go. That is Revelation 21, verse 22. The reason I say that could be indicating the end of a sacrificial system, um, well, for multiple reasons. There's no more sin. This is post-millennium. This is after Satan is destroyed. In Revelation 20, there's no more sin, no more wicked, um, no more, you know, need to really do any type of sacrifices with animals. And since we're going back to the garden, I would assume, you know, we're going to be, you know, not eating animals anymore, I would assume. So, because the number one cause really for the sacrificial system was when Adam and Eve sinned, they needed coats of skin. So... You know, I believe personally, in my opinion, even though I can't prove it, that in Genesis, the first animal was killed after the fall of mankind. I believe so, too. So, yeah. So, basically, this makes sense to me. This makes sense that there would be no temple at all at that point, because without sin, there's no need for a sacrificial system. So, and uh, the law is, the law of itself will be in our hearts at this point anyway, so... And that's why I believe Yahushua says, until heaven and earth pass away. So this, in my opinion, Revelations 21 verse 22 perfectly blends 
with Matthew 5, verse 18, which says, For verily I say unto you, until or till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one till shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled, which obviously includes the Levitical priesthood. So in a way, there is a, you know, you could say a cutoff point of the sacrifices. There is a cutoff point. Now, Christianity thinks that it already happened when in actuality, it doesn't happen until after the millennium and until you're at the new heaven, new earth, and there's no point for a sacrificial system, like I stated before, because you don't have sin. So you don't, I mean, Satan's defeated. You don't have any wicked people. Pretty much it's only people in the kingdom in the new heaven, new earth. You only have believers at that point. So anyway, so that's what Matthew 5, 18 says there. So, I mean, that's pretty much self-explanatory why I uh, linked those two up. So um, let's see here. We also got Isaiah 65, verse 17, and Isaiah 66, verse 22. And that's the last two we have for tonight's study. So it's going to be a very brief this is a very brief study just to explain when exactly the new heaven and new earth is. So here we go. The new heavens and new earth, Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. So there you go. Be, but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. So in Isaiah 65, 18, it's showing you that the new heaven and new earth is linked with the new Jerusalem. To me, that's key to know the timeline of this, to link up with Revelation 21. Um, and I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her. Remember, in Revelation 21, it says there's no more crying, no more pain, no more sorrow. So uh, the context of Isaiah 65 with the new heaven, new earth blends with Revelations 21. So, and it says, the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more there an infant of days, nor a child that has filled his days. Now, this is where it gets really tricky. I have to switch this up to in here. Neither shall be there any more child that dies untimely. Yeah, that makes more sense an old man who shall not complete his time for the youth shall be a hundred years old and the sinner who dies at a hundred years shall also be accursed. Basically it means that if you die at a hundred years at this point, you're cursed. Now where it gets tricky, I wonder if this verse 20 on, I wonder if it's talking about the new Jerusalem or if it's talking about the millennium time period, because um, I'm kind of wondering, dying? I don't know if people would be dying. So, um, And that's the tricky thing about prophecy. Sometimes it's not always in order, what I've noticed in end times prophecy. Sometimes it's like all jumbled. What you got to realize, too, is there's no such thing as chapter numbers and verse numbers in the original scriptures. So sometimes it's like not exactly in chronological order, sometimes the way our uh, Bibles are. So that's just something to keep in mind because verse 20 definitely sounds like more of a millennium thing where if you die at a hundred years old, it's a curse. If a sinner dies at a hundred years old. So it's just showing that, you know, basically the righteous are going to live for a very long time in the millennium, which would make sense because it's a thousand years. Um, oh yeah, sure. sis. that's a good point to bring up. Yeah, the celestial bodies of Adam and Eve. Now, um, there's two resurrections. The first resurrection, those that are left over from the tribulation, along with the dead in Messiah that are in Sheol, are going to be given resurrected bodies. Now, according to extra biblical texts, and you know, just what I've honestly always believed is that the bodies we have now were because of sin. These are not, this is not the image of Yahuwah, you know, carnal fallen flesh is not the image of the father. So, um, you know, I believe that Adam and Eve once had bodies, or if you prefer Kua, Adam and Kua had bodies that were like the angels. Um, Yahushua himself says in the resurrection, will we, we will be like the angels. And I think that's literal. 
That's, and this, to me, makes sense why the angels in the Old Testament are called the sons of Elohim. And in prophecy, in the book of Hosea, it says, in that day, probably referring to the resurrection in context, um, in that day, they shall be called sons and daughters of the living Elohim. So um, if you want, I can find that scripture for you in the book of Hosea. Um, but uh, I mean, all over scripture, there seems to be this resurrection thing. And that's a future study I want our group to do also is showing people that don't believe in the Brit Hadashah that the resurrection is not a new doctrine. The resurrection was talked about in the book of Job, in Isaiah, in other places in the Tanakh. This is, a, it's a Tanakh doctrine. It's not something brand new made up. And so, and actually that's one of the contentions with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Yahushua. They, it seems like they didn't believe in a resurrection when they tried to make Yahushua stumble when they said, you know, whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? You know, she marries this guy and then he dies. She marries his one brother and the brother dies and, you know, vice versa. They were trying to trick Yahushua. They were trying to trip him up. So to me, that seems to be a, a age long debate that some of the Yahudim did not believe in the resurrection. But anyway, just to explain on that and expound upon it, like my sister Marissa uh, messaged me, asked me to expound upon it for you viewers and listeners. So basically the resurrected bodies, we're going to have physical fleshy bodies of light, if that makes any sense. So physical bodies of light and the angels do have bodies. I want to, I want to expose that misconception. They have a body. Angels are not demons. They have a body. Okay. So when the sons of Elohim or the sons of Elohim came down in Genesis six, they took on human bodies. They gave up their resurrected bodies, like the type of bodies we're going to have. It's kind of like the reversal of the resurrection. They, they gave up their celestial bodies for human male bodies. They transformed into human men. So obviously when they came into the women in Genesis 6, 4, the women probably didn't even know that they were angels. They had no idea. Now, um, according to all these Greek mythology movies, supposedly they looked a little bit better than us normal men, which, you know, makes sense. But, uh, you know, and maybe the women were drawn to them by the way they looked like they were, you know, flashy, you know, they probably still had a glow to them that the women were attracted to rather than us normal mortal men. So, but um, yeah, so just to explain, that's what I believe about the resurrection. It's going to be, uh, we are going to be given a new physical house uh, of a body. So we're not going to have, you know, these decrepit bodies that rot. You know, so anyway, I, so I feel like that was necessary just to explain to people what the resurrection actually is. It's an actual physical transformation. And, and just to add one more thing, I think that's what it means to be born again. Um, I think sometimes in Christianity, they've mixed up the idea, um, be reborn with born again. Because see, talking about in second Corinthians five seventeen that, you know, um, you are, you are a new creation and Messiah. So what they'll do is they'll take that concept and then they'll, you know, say that we're already born again, brother. In actuality, Yahushua meant being born from above, being, you know, the resurrection. That's why Paul says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. So um, I trust that it's not too much for you guys. And I apologize if that's too much, if I went too deep a little bit for those that, um, you know, the resurrection might be foreign to them. So, but anyway, um, so the last thing I have here is Isaiah 66 verse 22. And that's it for tonight's study. So we're going to end with that. Yeah. So let's see here, Isaiah 66, verse 22, says here in the Brent's English Septuagint, for as the new heaven and the new earth, which I make remain before me, says you, who is so shall your seed and your name continue. So again, so 
that to me pretty much is self-explanatory. So you got the new heavens and new earth. Now, Isaiah 66 verse 23 says, and it shall come to pass from month to month and from Sabbath to Sabbath that all flesh shall come to worship before me in Jerusalem, says Yahuwah. Now, I'm still kind of, I don't know how I would interpret the, the time period of that in verse 23, whether that's the millennial or new, new heaven, new earth. I wouldn't see the point of, I mean, I guess, but if you got people coming from different parts of the earth, does that mean that you still got, you know, unconverted people in the new heaven, new earth? I don't know. I kind of, I, my personal opinion, I've always interpreted verse 23 to refer to the millennium. Um, to me, it just makes the most sense because if you look at Zechariah 14, the same thing is happening after the day of Yahuwah. So my, I could be wrong, but I, I still believe to this day, Isaiah 66 verse 23 is talking about a different time period than verse 22. I know it kind of doesn't make sense because the way the verse numbers are numbered, you know, but again, we got to realize too, that the original scrolls did not have chapter numbers. They did not have verse numbers. And not all of prophecies in sequential order, 110%. Even the book of Revelations is not all in chronological order, if that makes any sense. So I just wanted to explain that to the viewers and listeners, because um, I know some of our brothers and sisters believe that, you know, the coming up from Jerusalem, from one month to the next, from Sabbath to Sabbath, that that's talking about the new heaven, new earth. The only problem that I have with it is that, to me, it doesn't really make sense because it, if you match that up with Zechariah 14, Zechariah 14 is obviously millennial time period. So, and it, it's pretty much talking about the same thing. So it's talking about the, the Gentiles who have not converted come to Jerusalem and worship Yahuwah, you know? So... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really don't know, Sister Marissa, like the, the, you know, the, um, I look at the fullness of Gentiles as Yahuwah only knows when the fullness of the Gentiles come. That's when actually, and actually from what I've seen in scripture, the fullness of the Gentiles is right before the uh, tribulation, because I'll just show you, I don't want to be just throwing all my ideas out there without providing scripture. So it's a good, it's a good question you asked though about um, if what one, one last person accepted him before he returns. So I believe Yahuwah has a time clock. He has a time clock when he's going to cut off, you know, some Christian denominations call it probation, quote unquote pro probation period. So if we look at Matthew 24, 14, it says, and this glad tidings of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all ethnos. I want to make it clear. It's not talking about all countries. Okay. This, this Greek word for nations is actually ethnos, like ethnicity. And then shall the end come. So technically speaking, in my opinion, we're getting pretty close to that. We're getting pretty close to that because for the most part, um, you know, all ethnicities in some sort of level have heard the glad tidings. certain people of each ethnic group have heard the Basora. So, um, you know, I don't think it's, ha I don't think the end is just yet, but I think we're getting close to it in my humble opinion. Um, and Yahuwah has a certain number in Romans 11 and talks about the fullness of the Gentiles coming. So Yahuwah, only he knows when it's going to be, you know, a cutoff time for people to be grafted in to his people. And, you know, so, He's still going to give a second chance to people in the millennium. I don't know if I touched on that yet. He's still going to give, not all the wicked are destroyed on the day of Yahuwah. So he's going to give a remnant of those that came against Jerusalem even, shows how merciful our father is. He's actually going to give those that actually came up against his own people. He's going to give a remnant of whoever's left over a chance to repent in the millennium. And that's the purpose for Zechariah 14. Yeah, go ahead, Sister Sadie. Go ahead, sis. I saw your, your hand was up. Yes. Okay, so my thought is that um, um, we've always said that, like, when they do that last altar call, you never know when that last call is going to be. That's what we were taught in church. But um, Gentiles could be 
not necessarily a Christian. It could be just one coming to convert that knew you that you know is getting to know you who you know what I mean. And then as you saying about uh, it's getting out there. Well, we have a brother that's Vietnamese. We have a brother that is Indian. And uh, we can, they're here in the valley. And uh, it's just ironic that you would have an Indian that is from Pakistan and they are calling upon Yahuwah and they're getting their group. And the same thing for the, um, in, it's uh, the Thai, Taiwanese. I guess Taiwanese, is it Thai or? Gosh, now I got to think about that one. But he's a really neat brother. And he has a church actually in the valley. So they are hitting different. There's Persians that are coming. Um, so you, you know, uh, this word getting out to the nations, it's out there. And I think that, you know, you know, we just need to be ready within our own selves and clean up our act and really realize that he can come. I do know there's things they say that has to be done, has to still be fulfilled. Isn't that correct? Like the building of the temple or is that going to be in between? Well, that's actually after the fullness of the nations. That's why I was um, bringing up Matthew 24, 15, because um, 14 to 15, verse 14 is referring to the fullness of the nations that Paul talks about in Romans 11. It says, you know, they will be preached in all the inhabited world for a witness unto all ethnos, then shall the end come. And then you have the abomination of desolation right after that verse. That when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the set apart place, physical temple, okay? It's not the human body. The human body is not the abomination of desolation, okay? The standing in the set apart place. It's going to be a graven image in a temple in Jerusalem also known as in Revelations is called the image of the beast, okay? So who? So this is linking back to Daniel. He's even warning us to say, whosoever reads, let him understand, meaning, you know, go back to Daniel, spoken of by the prophet Daniel. So this is why we need to know um, prophecy throughout all the prophets. We can't just read Revelations and, you know, try right. to understand Revelations. And uh, my mom and I were talking about this the other night. You got to... Read all the prophets, Daniel, Micah, Malachi, um, Yeremiah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all of them. All of them talk about end time prophecy, a little here, a little there. You know, they're a little, here a little, there a little, precept by precept. So Okay, so by, by you um, saying that too, um, I've been hearing a little bit more and more that, you know, Trump is the better guy to be in office, but people are starting to think, is he the one that's going to bring in the Antichrist? Is yeah. he the one that will be setting him in because of the way he's believing? But, it's, I mean, he's the better choice, the two candidates running. But yeah. we, all we can do is pray that he would come to know Yahuwah, you know, because we know where he's headed. Yeah, and, you know, yeah he's already signed. He's already signed the Noahide laws, and he's already given his authority over to FEMA. Uh, and you have, to rem you have to remember, Trump was selected, like the, all, the rest of them. And when he was selected, when he supposedly won, Hillary Clinton and all the rest went over to the same bar and they celebrated. And you have to remember that Trump is a high wizard in masonry. So, yeah. No. Yeah, I didn't hear that about him being in high masonry. Um, masonry, yes. High wizard. Wow. Yes. All right. Well, yeah, yeah. stay on topic here since we're still recording. I don't mind uh, going off of different rabbit trolls, but while we're on the recording, let's just stay on topic here. So anyway, thank you for bringing that up, Sister Sadie. Um, that was a very good thing to bring up, good question to bring up. So as you can see here, it's a physical temple. It's a physical image that that's going to be made probably the statue of Jupiter, that same statue that's in St. Peter's Basilica today that they call the statue of Peter, um, which is mentioned in the book of second Maccabees chapter six, verse two, and um, also in first Maccabees chapter five, verse four. So um, 
you know, so I think that's going to conclude tonight's study though. We pretty much, uh, expound as much as we can on a short little study like this. So I pray that this guy would help you guys out a little bit, help you understand prophecy a little bit better, more, uh, definitely from a chronological view, understand when the new heaven and new earth is going to happen. I think it's important to understand this because it's going to understand, it's going to help us understand to know where we are in prophecy also to know at this moment in time where we are and from what it looks like we're, we're towards the end of the fullness of the Gentiles. So um, I think it's our job definitely to try to finish as much as we can witnessing the people as much as we can from now until Yahuwah, you know, cuts that time off and says, you know, that's done. Now, now, now I'm going to, I'm now I'm going to allow the man of lawlessness to come in the temple. So to me, that's my opinion on that, that I, I think that is, the Matthew 24, 14 to 15 are pretty much synchronicity. They're like right after one another. So um, we're, we probably still got a good little while, but we're definitely getting closer to the end of the fullness of the Gentiles in my, in my opinion. Um, we maybe have, uh, you know, give or take a couple of years, not, not too long from now um, until he's going to cut off that probation period. So um, it's definitely important for us to try to witness as much as we can right now. And um uh, you know, thank you for joining us. Um, I, I pray that this message would be a baraka to you and that you would, you would, um, that this would help your walk in Yahuwah and Yahusha and any believer, uh, not believe any non-believers that have came across. I pray that this would be a way for us to witness to you. And um, if you have not accepted Yahusha today, if you came across this study and you, you don't believe in the scriptures, I pray that the Father would open your eyes that if the Father's calling you to know him and to know his son, Yahushua, that he would open your eyes and show you that Yahushua died for you. Yahushua cares about you. He, he died for the sins of those from the world that the Father would gather to him. And he died for the sins of the world in that way that those that the Father calls would have a way back to the Father. And, um, if you have been strung in the heart and you feel convicted of your sin and you want to accept Yahushua as your savior, I pray that the, this is, uh, now is a better time than ever. You know, the biggest lie Satan ever, uh, you know, the biggest lie that Satan ever said to the world was and got the world to believe was you got all the time in the world to get right with the creator. So I pray that if you didn't get anything from this study that you would at least get that little message of the end of this study. Um, thank you for joining us. Have a great um, rest of your night. And to our brothers and sisters that are um, keeping the Sabbath tonight and that are out there on Facebook Live, thank you for bearing well with us. I know it kind of went a little bit longer than I wanted to, but I felt like it was necessary. So thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of your Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. Okay. Shabbat shalom. Are we off? Just a